Chapter 5 of the Chronicles of Avonlea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chronicles of Avonlea by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 5 The Winning of Lucinda, Part 2. I do hope I won't get any spots on this dress tonight, she reflected. It will have to do me for a gala dress for a year at least, and I have a creepy conviction that it is fearfully spottable. Bless Uncle Mark's good, uncalculating heart. How I would have detested it if he had given me something sensible and useful and ugly, as Aunt Amelia would have done. They all went to young John Penhallow's at early moonrise. Lucinda drove over the two miles of hill and dale with a youthful second cousin, by name Carrie Penhallow. The wedding was quite a brilliant affair. Lucinda seemed to pervade the social atmosphere, and everywhere she went a little ripple of admiration trailed after her like a wave. She was undeniably a belle, yet she found herself feeling faintly bored and was rather glad than otherwise when the guest began to fray off. "'I'm afraid I'm losing my capacity for enjoyment,' she thought, a little drearily. "'Yes, I must be growing old.' This is what it means when social functions begin to bore you. It was that unlucky Mrs. George who blundered again. She was standing on the veranda when Carrie Penhallow dashed up. "'Tell Lucinda that I can't take her back to the Grange. I have to drive Mark and Sissy Penhallow to Bright River to catch the two o'clock express. There will be plenty of chances for her with the others.' At this moment George Penhallow, holding his rearing horse with difficulty, shouted for his wife. Mrs. George, all in a flurry, dashed back into the still-crowded hall. Exactly to whom she gave her message was never known, to any of the Penhallows. But a tall, ruddy-haired girl, dressed in pale green organdy, Anne Shirley from Avonlea, told Marilla Cuthbert and Rachel Lynde as a joke the next morning how a chubby little woman in a bright pink fascinator had clutched her by the arm and gasped out, "'Carrie Penhallow can't take you. He says you're to look out for someone else,' and was gone before she could answer or turn around. Thus it was that Lucinda, when she came out to the veranda step, found herself unaccountably deserted. All the Grange penhallows were gone. Lucinda realized this after a few moments of bewildered seeking, and she understood that if she were to get to the Grange that night she must walk. Plainly there was nobody to take her. Lucinda was angry. It is not pleasant to find yourself forgotten and neglected. It is still less pleasant to walk home along a country road at one o'clock in the morning wearing a pale green voile. Lucinda was not prepared for such a walk. She had nothing on her feet save thin-soled shoes, and her only wraps were a flimsy fascinator and a short coat. "'What a guy I shall look, stalking home alone in this rig,' she thought crossly. There was no help for it unless she confessed her plight to some of the stranger guests and begged to drive home. Lucinda's pride scorned such a request in the admission of neglected involved. No, she would walk, since that was all there was to it, but she would not go by the main road, to be stared at by all and sundry who might pass her. There was a shortcut by way of a lane across the fields, and she knew every inch of it, although she had not traversed it for years. She gathered up the green vall as trimly as possible, slipped around the house in the kindly shadows, picked her way across the side lawn, and found a gate which opened into a birch-bordered lane where the frosted trees shone with silvery golden radiance in the moonlight. Lucinda flitted down the lane, growing angrier at every step as the realization of how shamefully she seemed to have been treated came home to her. She believed that nobody had thought about her at all, which was tenfold worse than premeditated neglect. As she came to the gate at the lower end of the lane, a man who was leaning over it started with a quick intake of his breath, which, in any other man than Romney Penhallow, or for any other woman than Lucinda Penhallow, would have been an exclamation of surprise. Lucinda recognized him with a great deal of annoyance and a little relief. She would not have to walk home alone. But with Romney Penhallow, would he think she had contrived it so purposely? Romney silently opened the gate for her, silently latched it behind her, and silently fell into step beside her. Down across a velvety sweep of field they went. The air was frosty, calm and still. Over the world lay a haze of moonshine and mist that converted East Grafton's prosaic hills and fields into a shimmering fairyland. At first Lucinda felt angrier than ever. What a ridiculous situation! How the Penhallows would laugh over it! 
As for Romney, he too was angry with the trick impish chance had played him. He liked being the butt of an awkward situation as little as most men, and certainly to be obliged to walk home over moonlit fields at one o'clock in the morning with the woman he had loved and never spoken to for fifteen years was the irony of fate with a vengeance. Would she think he had schemed for it? And how the deuce had she come to be walking home from the wedding at all? By the time they had crossed the field and reached the wild cherry lane beyond it, Lucinda's anger was mastered by her saving sense of humor. She was even smiling, a little malicious, under her fascinator. The lane was a place of enchantment, a long, moonlit colonnade, a down which beguiling wood nymphs might have footed it featly. The moonshine fell through the arching boughs and made a mosaic of silver light and clear-cut shadow for the unfriendly lovers to walk in. On either side was the hovering gloom of the woods, and around them was a great silence unstirred by wind or murmur. Midway in the lane, Lucinda was attacked by a sentimental recollection. She thought of the last time Romney and she had walked home together through this very lane from a party at Young John's. It had been moonlight then, too, and, Lucinda checked aside, they had walked hand in hand. Just here, by the big gray beach, he had stopped her and kissed her. Lucinda wondered if he were thinking of it, too, and stole a look at him from under the lace border of her fascinator. But he was striding moodily along with his hands in his pockets and his hat pulled down over his eyes, passing the old beach without a glance at it. Lucinda checked another sigh, gathered up an escaped flutter of wall, and marched on. Past the lane, a range of three silvery harvest fields sloped down to Peter Penhallow's brook, a wide, shallow stream bridged over in the olden days by the mossy trunk of an ancient fallen tree. When Lucinda and Romney arrived at the brook, they gazed at the brawling water blankly. Lucinda remembered that she must not speak to Romney just in time to prevent an exclamation of dismay. There was no tree. There was no bridge of any kind over the brook. Here was a predicament. But before Lucinda could do more than despairingly ask herself what was to be done now, Romney answered, not in words, but in deeds. He coolly picked Lucinda up in his arms, as if she had been a child instead of a full-grown woman of no mean avoir du poids, and began to wade with her through the water. Lucinda gasped helplessly. She could not forbid him, and she was so choked with rage over his presumption that she could not have spoken in any case. Then came the catastrophe. Romney's foot slipped on a treacherous round stone. There was a tremendous splash, and Romney and Lucinda Penhallow were sitting down in the middle of Peter Penhallow's brook. Lucinda was the first to regain her feet. About her clung in heartbreaking limpness the ruined voile. The remembrance of all her wrongs that night rushed over her soul, and her eyes blazed in the moonlight. Lucinda Penhallow had never been so angry in her life. "'You darned idiot!' she said in a voice that literally shook with rage. Romney meekly scrambled up the bank after her. "'I'm awfully sorry, Lucinda,' he said, striving with uncertain success to keep a suspicious quiver of laughter out of his tone. "'It was wretched clumsy of me, but that pebble turned right under my foot. Please forgive me for that and for other things.' Lucinda deigned no answer. She stood on a flat stone and wrung the water from the poor green voile. Romney surveyed her apprehensively. "'Hurry, Lucinda,' he entreated. "'You will catch your death of cold.' "'I never take cold,' answered Lucinda, with chattering teeth. "'And it is my dress I am thinking of, was thinking of. "'You have more need to hurry. "'You are sopping wet yourself, and you know you are subject to colds. "'There, come.' Lucinda picked up the stringy train, which had been so brave and buoyant five minutes before, and started up the field at a brisk rate. Romney came up to her and slipped his arm through hers in the old way. For a long time they walked along in silence. Then Lucinda began to shake with inward laughter. She laughed silently for the whole length of the field, and at the line fence between Peter Penhallow's land and the Grange Acres she paused, threw back the fascinator from her face, and looked at Romney defiantly. "'You are thinking of that,' she cried, "'and I am thinking of it, and we will go on thinking of it at intervals for the rest of our lives.' But if you ever mention it to me, I'll never forgive you, Romney Penhallow. I never will, Romney promised. There was more than a suspicion of laughter in his voice this time, but Lucinda did not choose to resent it. She did not speak again until they reached the Grange Gate. She faced him solemnly. 
It was a case of atavism, she said. Old Grandfather Gordon was to blame for it. At the Grange almost everybody was in bed. What with the guests straggling home at intervals and hurrying sleepily off to their rooms, nobody had missed Lucinda, each set supposing she was with some other set. Mrs. Frederick, Mrs. Nathaniel, and Mrs. George alone were up. The perennially chilly Mrs. Nathaniel had kindled a fire of chips in the blue room grate to warm her feet before retiring, and the three women were discussing the wedding in subdued tones, when the door opened and the stately form of Lucinda, stately even in the dragged voile, appeared with the damp Romney behind her. "'Lucinda Penhallow!' gasped they, one and all. "'I was left to walk home,' said Lucinda coolly. "'So Romney and I came across the fields.' There was no bridge over the brook, and when he was carrying me over, he slipped and we fell in. That is all. No, Cecilia, I never take cold, so don't worry. Yes, my dress is ruined, but that is of no consequence. No, thank you, Cecilia, I do not care for a hot drink. Romney, do go and take off those wet clothes of yours immediately. No, Cecilia, I will not take a hot foot bath. I am going straight to bed. Good night. When the door closed on the pair, the three sisters-in-law stared at each other. Mrs. Frederick, feeling herself incapable of expressing her sensations originally, took refuge in a quotation. "'Do I sleep? Do I dream? Do I wonder and doubt? Is things what they seem, or is visions about?' "'There will be another Penhallow wedding soon,' said Mrs. Nathaniel, with a long breath. "'Lucinda has spoken to Romney at last.' "'Oh, what do you suppose she said to him?' cried Mrs. George. My dear Cecilia, said Mrs. Frederick, we shall never know. They never did. End of chapter 5, part 2